this presentation, we'll discuss best practice guidelines for ensuring that your CFD simulations are accurate. For CFD simulations, the mesh plays a significant role in the effort to minimize errors. By the end of this presentation, you will know important meshing considerations such as quality and cell type and best practices for mesh generation. The objective is to understand how you can build the mesh and perform the simulation in a way that minimizes error. Mesh quality plays an important role in the success of a CFD simulation. When deciding on a meshing strategy, three factors must be considered. The accuracy required of the simulation, the computational efficiency or speed of the calculation, and the amount of time and effort needed to create a particular kind of mesh. Questions that need to be answered for each factor include what is the maximum skewness and aspect ratio that will allow you to achieve sufficiently accurate results? Is it sufficient just to resolve the overall flow features, meaning that a relatively low cell count is required, or is it necessary to resolve more details of the flow, which in turn would require more cells? And how much time do you have to spend working on the mesh? Plus, will the potential benefits of a crafted mesh that takes a long time to create compared to a polyhedral mesh, justify the additional time needed? These questions have a different answer for every simulation, so the goal is always to find the best compromise between all of the factors. And in many cases, polyhedra or polyhex core meshes represent the best compromise. When you create the mesh, it should be fine enough to capture and resolve important physics such as boundary layers, heat transfer, wakes, shock waves, and any high gradients in the flow. Specifically for boundary layers, when a well-resolved solution is needed in the boundary layer, both the velocity and thermal boundary layers should be considered, and the normal guideline is to have at least 10 to 15 elements across the thickness of the boundary layer, with an expansion or growth ratio of no more than 1.2 to 1.3, although 1.3 is already pretty high. For problems involving heat transfer, for laminar to turbulent transition, the first grid point should be close enough to the wall so that the value of Y plus is around 1. The purpose of this slide is to show an example of what constitutes a good mesh for an application where high resolution of the boundary layer is needed. You can see in the image on the right, there are 15 to 20 prism layers in the mesh, a smooth growth rate for the layers, and the shape of the boundary layer profile can be clearly identified in the vector plot. On the other hand, the image on the left shows an under-resolved boundary layer where there are only two or three layers from the wall to the edge of the boundary layer, which is where the velocity contours are red. The shape of the profile can't really be seen with so few points. The mesh on the left might be okay if the flow behavior at that location is not that important, but if that was an airfoil surface where the goal is to predict drag and lift coefficients or flow separation, it would be necessary to use a good mesh like the one on the right. On this slide, we see three important elements of mesh quality. In the top row, cells should not be too distorted or skewed. This means for quadrilateral or hexahedral cells, very sharp angles are not desirable. In the middle row, cells should also not be too stretched. In other words, the aspect ratio should not be too high, and a good cell has edges nearly the same length. A highly stretched cell like this is not desirable except in boundary layers. In boundary layers, it's okay to have high aspect ratio cells as long as they also satisfy the requirements that were discussed in the previous two slides. Finally, in the bottom row, the transition between neighboring cells should not be too large. On the left, there is a moderate growth ratio, while on the right, there's a huge jump in the cell size, which can cause convergence problems and sometimes also the prediction of strange, unphysical flows. Here we have some recommendations for quality targets you should try to achieve in your mesh. Recommendations for orthogonal quality are difficult because there is not one clearly defined answer for what values the solution can tolerate. We can only talk about approximate ranges of values and one solution may work with a certain minimum value of orthogonal quality while another with the same minimum orthogonal quality may fail. That said, a good general guideline is the recommendation from the Fluent User's Guide, which says that the worst value should be greater than 0.01 and the average value much higher than that. Try to maintain aspect ratios below 100 
except in boundary layers, and try to keep the growth rate between neighboring cells below 2. For problems involving shocks or shear layers, use your experience to know where finer grid resolution is needed, and try to keep the angle between the grid face and flow vector small, or in other words, as much as possible, try to align the grid with the flow direction in problems where the flow direction is known. Grid refinement can also be a good way to evaluate the mesh sensitivity of the solution. An example is shown at the right, where grid adaption is used to locally refine the mesh where it's estimated that errors may be higher. This kind of estimate is normally based on the gradients of the solution variables, and in Fluent, you can either manually refine the grid based on this, or you can make use of the automated grid refinement capability. Sudden changes in mesh density should be avoided in important regions of the flow. In the grids on this slide, the right-hand image shows a good quality grid. The mesh size is growing, but the growth is gradual and continuous. On the left, tet meshes with inflation layers are generally okay, but here there's only a few layers, and then there's a huge jump in size to the first tet cell. If you're interested in resolving the boundary layer in the problem on the left, then there should ideally be more inflation layers and a much smaller jump in size between the last layer and the first tetrahedral cell. However, for the mesh on the left, there could be situations where it's a good enough mesh if the region that's being highlighted is not of primary importance for the overall simulation. When the flow direction is known, and it's possible to create the grid so it's aligned with the flow, then quadrilateral or hexahedral cells are usually more accurate than triangular or tetrahedral cells. This is illustrated by the example of an inviscid coflow jet. The upper jet has a velocity of 0.1 meters per second, and the lower jet 1.0 meters per second. In the solution on the quadrilateral mesh, there is a small, sharply resolved layer between them, and this layer does not grow as the flow proceeds downstream. On the triangular mesh, there's a much wider and more diffuse layer that grows in thickness. However, on this slide, we can see that quad cells lose their advantage when the grid is no longer aligned with the flow. The example here shows an inviscid flow in which both streams have the same velocity, and there's a scalar with value 1 on the top and value 0 below. Because the flow is inviscid, there should be no mixing between the streams, and therefore the width of the mixing layer is an indicator of the discretization error. On the previous slide, there was much more diffusion between the layers on the triangular mesh, but here, where the hex cells are not aligned with the flow, there's no real difference in the width of the mixing layer, 